say you pushed it in your class, you talk about it a lot in your class, yeah. and that's when we cut. Right, uh, known on the basis of, of his horror films primarily. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then another director I put in that same category is Maurice Tourneur, the basically a silent director, although his work goes right through the 1940s. And uh, I think he was perhaps um, the only director in that early period, 1914-15, who really, on a very different level, equaled Griffith. I mean, he wasn't being as innovative as Griffith, but he was making, in some ways, even more sophisticated films. So I think Maurice Turner is a much, much underrated director. Uh, on the other level, I was talking about the purely commercial level, I think there are directors like um, uh, William, William Sider, um, who was always been a kind of useful contract director at Universal and Fox did everything they gave him. Not a classic among them, but he was somehow so adept at making films that reflected the immediate period they were being made in. They're very, very useful films for judging mores and morals and ways of life and the way people react. Films like um, Skinner's Dress Suit in the 1920s or even uh, Sons of the Desert with Laurel and Hardy, which is a lovely film of his type and I think the best thing they ever did. <coughs> and even into the 50s, a film like uh, the Lady Wants Mink, which is an Eve Arden comedy about, very much like Skinner's Dress Suit, about keeping up with the neighbors and getting raises and getting the new TV set in before you can avoid it, before you can afford it. And I think Cedar did a lot of very, very charming, very tasteful films. He did some of the best of the Deanna Durbin films. I think he's a very, very good director. Or a man like Robert Florey, who worked best, I think, in B film, but with tremendous style and craftsmanship. Um, somebody like William Deedley, I think, in the particularly up to 1934, was a tremendous director. And then he became the sort of the big company prestige director, and might have remained very good. I think his, his style diminished a great deal. His so early was, Fox and Warner's things? Uh, mainly, mainly Warner's. I mean, there are some Fox ones like particularly Six Hours to Live, but I think the Warner films like Madame du Barry and uh, Fog of a Frisco and many others, I mean, they're tremendous pictures, The Last Flight. And I think many of those are not as well known as they should be. So there are a lot of directors that... Um, while they're not exactly ignored, I mean, their major contributions have perhaps been really, really acknowledged. In the last 25 to 30 years, uh, you've really ha had, a, had a great role in the kind of the acknowledgement and the, uh, the popularization of film history. Um, for example, your, your books, uh, 10, 15 years ago, the uh, amount of literature available on film uh, really paled com as compared to today, and certainly while Many of the books are, are not. Many of the books that are available on the market are not all that worthwhile. Certainly, there's been uh, kind of more of a focus on that. W what do you think is responsible for that that kind of popularization? Well, a number of reasons. One, I think, of course, is the tremendous availability now of more and more old film, thanks to the um, uh, thanks partly to TV that's made all this material available and has preserved it so it can be shown. So you can see a lot of the films that are just writing about them. Secondly, of course, I think. To a degree, the uh, downfall of a lot of commercial filmmaking today, I mean, there just isn't the same class and the same style, so the audience, instead of going back to old films looking for antique study pieces, uh, are gradually beginning to realize they're still valid and worthwhile pieces of entertainment on their own. And secondly, thirdly, of course, the film schools have educated a whole new group of students to, who want to become uh, writers or teachers themselves, so there's a, a much greater serious instant film history than there used to be. And it's particularly, it, it's particularly good in this country because that, in, that interest, I think, um, exists in other countries too, but there's not a great deal they can do about it. There aren't the same facilities in other countries for seeing the film or for getting jobs in that field. And I think over here at least there's a 50-50 chance if you want to get involved in some way in the academic side of film, teaching or even making film in a, to a degree, um, you have a good chance of pulling it off if you're you know, willing to um, work at it and perhaps take a lesser salary than you might get somewhere else. Of course, and in film preservation, the many titles uh, from the 20s and 30s that have been lost, uh, what would you say are the titles that are, that are that if, if you could, by some magic, have, say, half a dozen t lost titles uh, mm -hmm. appear, what, what would they be f for you? Well, I mean, the, the two key ones, unquestionably for me, would be uh, The Devil's Pass Key, the Straheim film, and Four Devils by Murnau. Um, only slightly less important because he's such a tremendous director, of course, the Missing Griffith film, particularly The Greatest Thing in Life and That Royal Girl and uh, The Escape. I think those three would be marvelous to find. Um, and there are many others. I mean, every time one comes across a film, for example, Raoul Walsh's Regeneration is an incredible 1915 rediscovery. We knew 
nothing about it five years ago, and it sort of completely revitalizes our knowledge of, of silent film in that period. But we, have n we don't have another Raoul Walsh film until The Thief of Baghdad in 1924, and he was making five, ten films a year in that period. So there's at least 50 missing Raoul Walsh films, which might be absolutely fantastic. So many title that comes to mind there is uh, Lost and Found on a South Sea Island that, that he filmed in the South Seas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a lost film? Yeah. yeah. There's nothing of Ra Walsh that I know of between, uh, between New Generation and uh, you know, The Old Thief of Baghdad. Uh, recently, uh, the Los Angeles Museum of Art announced that London After Midnight had been found? That's a rumor that keeps cropping up, and we'd hoped to show it at Telluride this year if indeed it had been found, because it was, of course, the 100th anniversary of um, Cheney's birth this year, and it would have been an ideal chance to show it, and we applied to Metro if indeed it, they had it. And while there was always a chance that they had it and were holding it back for some special promotion of their own, it seemed that they were honest that they replied that they didn't have it was fairly honest. Um, so it's a film that the rumors constantly crop up and are dashed immediately. So as of the moment, we don't know of a print. Mm -hmm. I did see the film many, many years ago in Paris, and it's a terribly disappointing film. Um, I know that everybody won't believe that until they see it. I mean, it, I wouldn't either if I hadn't seen it. But it is a very, very dull and disappointing film. And when it finally is found, as it may well be one day, I think a lot of people are going to be extremely disappointed. But it'll be good to have it back. But as of the moment, it's, it's still a lost item. John, one second. Sorry. Of course, von Stroheim's greed uh, is always pointed to as, as uh, being cut. Uh, what has your experience been in, in uh, kind of researching that? Uh, well, I mean, the, I think the, I mean, one is all again always like the Holy Grail is always showing up somewhere. There are always rumors that a longer version of greed has been found. Um, but A, there's no, I can't think of any earthly reason why there should be, because it was never sort of ex accepted as a 40 real film. They were constantly whittling away at it, and there'd be no reasons for Prince to get loose while they were, while they were still working on it. Um, I mean, one hears the story about Mussolini having a print, but I mean, where on earth would it have come from? Um, what astonishes and appalls me is the fact that Stroheim, who'd been through all those problems before with earlier films, didn't know that it was going to happen again and didn't make at least one print for his own preservation. I mean, he'd been the easiest thing in the world to have done that, and then we'd really know. John, I mean, I would. Sorry. Action, greed? Yeah. Okay. Wrong. Wrong. You need to answer the question. Oh, we, we got that, didn't we? Did we get my question? Yeah. No. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, is there any truth to rumors that circulate that Mussolini had a print of greed secreted away? Well, I mean, Mussolini was a, an, an, an interesting collector. He, he did have things like uh, The King of Jazz, which has been the backbone of the reconstruction of that film. Um, but I can't honestly see why he would have had it, or why anybody would have had a print of greed, because they were still cutting it. There'd be no earthly reason for a complete print, print getting out. Um, I can see odd reels or outtakes turning up somewhere, but not a complete print of the final film, which was, after all, never a final film, because they never were sure how long it was going to run. So, um, well, what, is, what appalls me and astounds me is that Stroheim himself, who had been through this whole routine with merry-go-round and foolish wives and knew what was going to, must have known what was going to happen. Why on earth he didn't, you know, square away one print for reference so that he could have a permanent record of what he'd done? And it seems unforgivable to me that he didn't. Is there, is there one studio uh, more than, than others that, that has preserved their films? I think probably Metro is the best. I mean, despite what they did to, to Greed, uh, and of course, I must also, as a, as a poster to that, say much as I would, there's nothing I'd rather do in this world than see all agreed. Um, somehow I have my doubt that 40 reels of that intensity would hold up as well as the, the, the cut version of 10 reels. I and mean, I'd love to see perhaps a, an interim version of 20 reels, but somehow I really can't see seeing more than, four, seeing that 40 reel version as more than just an academic exercise, much as I'd love to. But no, apart from what they did to that, Metro has been, um, at least willing to make a token contribution towards the preservation. I mean, they've got a lot of films which they haven't copied yet, but all the films that seem to have some kind of artistic value, they've made some attempt to copy, which has unfortunately meant tossing aside all of the, or most of the pre-1920 films. They seem to feel that anything pre-1920 is sort of academic and dated and primitive and will have no value, which of course is totally wrong because there's some marvelous things in that period. But at least from what they were able to survive, able to preserve during the 20s, they did try to make uh, you know, copies of everything. 
Um, one can argue the way they do it, did it, because in many cases they had all these lovely original 35 millimeter tone prints with all their meticulous lighting and tinting and coloring. And sometimes without even cleaning them, they made Duke negatives. And Our Dancing Daughters is a very good case in point. They made a negative of that without even cleaning the original. And then they destroyed the original thinking they were protected. And then when you look at the copy they made, it's full of hairs and dirt and there's a little piece of uh, fuzz that follows Johnny Mac Brown's nostrils around for about 20 minutes and it looks as though it's just dirt in the gate. And it's a very, very poor print. And if they'd seen how poor it was, at least they could have um, done it again. But at least they did make copies. They did make some attempt to, to save what they considered was the best of their collection. Unlike a company like Paramount, which had no interest at all in doing it and would uh, just literally junk stuff right and left and even discourage attempts by the AFI and by uh, the Museum of Modern Art to take key films and copy them for them. Many, many of the Paramount titles, particularly from the transitional period uh, from Silence to Sound, are gone. Uh, it would seem. W wouldn't MCA TV, for example, uh, ha have any of that material? Or? Well, they couldn't have it unless Paramount had saved it. And I remember I was at Paramount doing some work about 20 years ago or 15 years ago, and uh, the print of um, A City Gone Wild, the James Cruz film with Louise Brooks, was just on the verge of decomposing. You could see the, the hypo coming in. And I ran the film thinking we might use a piece of it in a film I was making for Paramount at the time, a documentary called The Love Goddesses. And as it happened, we didn't. And I'm glad I saw it then, because about six months later it started to decompose and they threw away the worst reel. And then their logic was, well, without that reel, the rest of it is useless, so we we'll throw the rest of it away too. And that, you know, it's a Louise Brooks film and a James Cruz film, totally gone. And they did that with a lot of very, very key films. But the Victor Fleming film, The Rough Riders. Yeah, that's another case that was destroyed about uh, 15 years ago. Completely just Just trash. threw it out, because, because a couple of reels were no good, so those were junked, and then out goes the rest of it. How about a, a 1928 Wellman film, Legion of the Condemned, with Gary Cooper, one of his first starring roles? Yeah, I don't know. That, I mean, the, the, that certainly wasn't there in the vault when I was working there, so it must have gone that route sometime earlier. Mm -hmm. now, there's a lot of key Paramount material gone from that period. Uh, a W.C. Fields film that you wrote about in, in your book on Fields, you, You're Telling Me, mm -hmm. uh, is, that, uh, is that a lost film? Or oh, no, that that's been in... Uh, that's, that's a talkie, of course. Yeah. That's, uh, for, for years it was lost, but I think there, it was a matter of uh, legal rights withholding it rather than any, any physical loss, because it's now available and can be booked, and it's a very funny film. In the, in the last five, six years, what titles have come to light? Well, uh, not so much the really big films. I mean, uh, we've... Uh, uh, I think the last major discovery of a feature was perhaps the, the Raoul Walsh film, Regeneration, which I mentioned before, which was actually f a print that I think was found in Latin America and saved by David Shepard, who was with the, um, you know, the, 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 actually then at the Screen Directors Guild. And I can't think of a major individual film since then of that importance, although other things have been found. But of course there have been terribly important discoveries in other areas, particularly all this Chaplin material that was found by Kevin Brownlow, which is not only I think a delight in itself because we've all, we've all become so jaded with seeing the old Chaplin films over and over again and suddenly to see completely fresh material in beautiful prints and to show what, you know, what a really fresh impact that stuff had, I think gave us all the kind of jolt we needed to remind us that we've been sort of paying lip service to Chaplin and he was more than just that. And it not only was good footage on its own, but it also gave us a great insight into his working, working methods, which was very valuable. So to me, that, uh, that Chaplin discovery by Brownlow and, Ke and David Gill, who worked with him, was perhaps the, the major filmic discovery of the past few years. One of the most exciting uh, rediscoveries uh, was a result of, of your work uh, without Alex Gordon at Fox. Many of those early John Ford titles yes. uh, and the Walsh and Murnau films. Well, I, I, I shouldn't take any credit for that. I, mean, I work with Alex in a very, very tangential position and was able to make a few suggestions which may have helped or given him a few directions to explore, but I mean, he did virtually all that work on his own with a great deal of opposition because Fox brought him in to see what was there and all the people between the higher echelon and the lower echelon had no interest at all in this stuff and would put all sorts of obstacles in his way and say it didn't exist and uh, it had been destroyed and he would persevere and go back ten times after the, the same title and finally find it. And also he contacted the European archives, particularly the Czech film archive, and brought stuff over from there which didn't exist. So, um, you know, I hope I was of some help in making suggestions, but basically that was Alex Gordon's deal. Is uh, one of those early, early Fox films, The, the Big Trail of Walsh, uh, I'm sorry, John Wayne's uh, first mm -hmm. starring role, is that, has that survived? Oh, yes. 
Although under rather strange circumstances, for initially I, I saw that film in Germany right after the war when I was in the British Army, and the German version had survived, and it was a very, very impressive film. Of course, John Wayne wasn't in that. He was only seen in long shots. It had a totally German cast. And for a long while, that seemed to be the only version that might be in existence. And then um, when Alex started working on this project, he found a negative in France, which was not in very good shape. The French had apparently recut some of it, and the uh, track didn't always match the image, but basically it was all there. And he brought that over and made up a couple of prints. And I think the Museum of Mar Modern Art now is working on that in a, in, with a view to restoring it to its um, widescreen uh, version. So that should be out <coughs> without, you know, before, before too long in its original widescreen version. But it's a very, very important film. Uh, your, your series at the New School uh, has really br brought a lot of films to light uh, where audience can get, audiences can, can, uh, can come and see them. How long have you been presenting that series? Well, we're up now to a series about number 48 or 49, so it must be, I think, about 15 years, because initially we did it twice a year, the spring and the fall, and then we added a summer series. So it's about, I'd say it's about 15 years. And it's interesting how initially the stuff I showed was fairly surefire material. It just wasn't being shown, films like Sven Gali with Barrymore and uh, Hell's Angels, you know, the Hughes film, and that kind of material. It was all good material, but just virtually unseen at that time. And eventually, of course, it became fairly standard fare. It plays around all the time now. And um, I've been able to sort of get into a position where the audience gradually has built up an interest in seeing not only good film, but also obscure films and the interesting misfires. And I've played the kind of stuff recently that I wouldn't have dreamed of getting away with in the early days. And I think the audience now sort of, in a sense, probably kind of trusts me. And they, if they've never heard of the film, they figure there's some reason to be, to be seeing it. And they come along very dutifully to see things that, uh, you know, a few years ago I wouldn't even have shown at NYU to a very specialized class. And there's a very good audience, and um, they're quite happy to see obscure films. Uh, like this coming year, I'm showing um, a film called um, Through Different Eyes, which was a, an early talkie, which is very much like Rashomon. It used the soundtrack to tell the same story from three different viewpoints. And unfortunately, the soundtrack is gone. All that's left is the silent version with subtitles which is still very interesting, but you have to imagine how sound was used, but I'm sure they'll be very patient and enjoy that. Is that Sylvia Sidney's first film? That's right, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. And occasionally I've shown uh, you know, very interesting European films without subtitles and provided a synopsis with it, so the audience has really had to work and read the synopsis first and then sort of be alert throughout the film, and they've been very willing to do that. It's a very, very nice audience. And it's, a, and it's also very rewarding to be able to bring prints back from Europe, which otherwise haven't been shown here, and sort of expose them for the first time to an audience and hope that they work. And once in a while with a film that I particularly have loved maybe for 40 years, and to bring it over finally and show it, and then for it not to work is a little disappointing, but it hasn't, ha hasn't happened very often. What are some of the other titles that you'll be presenting uh, this, this fall? Uh, well, the old uh, Charles Boyer, Mel Oberon film, The Battle, which is one of those early French uh, co-productions of the French, German, and British version made at the same time in 1934. Um, Metro, MGM, have suddenly made available a lot of very early, uh, fairly obscure talkies, which, um, having made them available, they, they then sort of reneged and didn't want to release them after all. It was just too much trouble for the limited amount of money they'd get out of it. But they have agreed to let me have some, as I've been playing quite a lot of <coughs> interesting MGM films from the 30s, like Fugitive Lovers, the sort of the cross-country bus film that preceded to happen one night. And I'm doing The Solitaire Man, a, Spencer Tra a Herbert Marshall, Lionel Atwell film in the um, early fall and uh, some British George Formby comedies which haven't been shown here before. So it's, uh, it's, it's very much of a mixed bag. And I very rarely get to the big prestige films anymore because if somebody now discovers something like Waterloo Bridge, it'll be shown somewhere else. I don't, I don't really, I'm not needed for that anymore. What I, what I see my place now is to bring up these interesting, obscure films and uh, concentrate on directors like, say, Robert Florey, who um, uh, is a director I like very much, as I mentioned earlier. And one thing I'm doing at the New School is to show three of Robert Flory's B films together, one from Warner's, one from Paramount, and one from Columbia, to sort of show how he would work better under certain circumstances and do different things at different studios. Have you been... Oh, sorry. Uh.